Next week is going to be one of the special weeks for this congregation, Mission Sunday, a day in which all the monies that are collected on that day will be going to mission work. Last week, we had the privilege of seeing a video on some of the mission work that we accomplished last year by the grace of God and through the generosity of this congregation. And we want to be able to continue that. And so our lesson this morning, we're going to be dealing with this idea of giving, not specifically about uh, why we should give and so forth, except to look at one example in the Bible of how God has given to us. And I know when we talk about giving, we, we like to look at examples that the Bible gives to us. When Paul wrote to the church here in Corinth, he gave the example of those Macedonians, those amazing people who out of their poverty gave and beyond their means gave to take care of those poor saints down in Jerusalem. And yet when he had talked to those in Macedonia, he bragged to them about those of Achaia, those in Corinth, and how they had been willing to give a year in advance. And now he's writing to them, encouraging them that they be prepared with that gift, lest when he comes they be ashamed of all the boasting that they have done. And when he talks about that gift, he comes down to the end there of chapter 9. He has been talking about uh, the example of those individuals. And the last verse in chapter 9 is the verse we want to look at this morning. It's a statement, but it's a declarative statement that he makes. And on that occasion, Paul says simply, Thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. Have you ever received a gift that was so great that you called it indescribable? You know, around Christmas time, if you look in the Neiman Marcus Christmas catalog, you'll find all kinds of extraordinary gifts that are available. Gifts primarily that only those who are extremely wealthy could buy. And usually there's going to be someone on TV that's going to talk about some of those. Several years back, when Joan London was the guest or was the host of Good Morning America, she had talked about some of those special gifts that are available that if you might want to purchase for them. By the way, if anybody's thinking about getting the preacher here, Jason, a gift, he might be interested in this. Uh, the first thing she mentioned was a Jaguar 200. You could go down to the dealership, plop down $80,000 as a down payment. And then when that car came in, you paid an additional $507,000. And that's not the most expensive car that's available. They have some sports cars that go over a million dollars. But if you can't afford something like that, you'd think, man, an individual has a car like that. You've got to have something to help keep that car looking good. And so they have an 8-ounce can of car wax that they will sell you for only $3,400. And one of the things that I found most intriguing, I don't know why anybody would want to buy this, I know it's a useful object, a commode seat made of gold and silver and inlaid with precious jewels valued at $300,000. I, I kid a lot of times in my classes about, you know, how I'd like to have a Corvette, you know, one of those models that's around fifty dollars to $70,000. Uh, I know I'm never going to own anything like that. But, you know, if somebody just out and out gave me a gift like that, you would find here's one preacher that would be speechless. I don't know what in the world I would say about something like that. But it's not because that gift is indescribable. It's just because I'd be overwhelmed by it. And I'll guarantee you, any of those gifts that we mentioned, if you go to any of the catalogs or the papers where they'll be advertised, someone is going to give you a good, solid description of those idols, items and why you need to purchase it. They're able to describe those things. But the Apostle Paul was talking about a gift that God has given to every one of us. And he says of that gift, it is indescribable. Now men have tried through the centuries to describe this gift, the gift of Christ. And they've all failed miserably. And the reason why is because Paul says it's indescribable. But what makes the gift of Christ so indescribable? Why is it that we can't describe what that gift really is like? And this morning we want to talk about four things about the gift of Christ that make it an indescribable gift. Number one, it's an indescribable gift because of the nature of Christ. When Jesus was born, it had been prophesied, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, 
which is being translated, God with us. Can you imagine God walking on this earth, reaching out to hurting humanity, to bring them back into Himself? How are you going to describe God? How do you describe that which is spirit, when all that we have ever seen in this life is physical, the material? Now we can describe the human body, and we can talk about the different systems that make up this body, the respiratory system, the reproductive system, the nervous system, the skeletal system, and so forth. And we can talk about the different kinds uh, of, of cells that make up the different parts of the body, the blood, the heart, and so forth. But what material comes together to form a spirit? Oh, wait, that's right. There's no material in a spirit. A spirit doesn't have material. It's not matter. It's something entirely different, something we're not familiar with, something we've never seen. So how do you describe that which is spirit when all we've ever known in life is the material? How do you go about describing Him who is omniscient when all of us as individuals and even combined are so limited in the knowledge that we have? The truth of the matter is that the limited cannot explain the unlimited. I joked about this when I was speaking one time up at St. Clair Prison with the men, and I got up there and I told them, I said, I'd love to speak to you tonight about quantum physics. The only problem is I don't know a thing about quantum physics. Why can't I discuss that with them? Why can't I explain that to you? Because I don't know it. You cannot explain what you do not know. You cannot impart to people that which you do not have. You can't talk about and explain that which is omniscient when we're so limited in knowledge. How do you go about describing Him who is omnipotent when all of us have such limited power? Maybe some of y'all remember a gentleman by the name of James Watt. James Watt was a Scottish engineer, and many people believe that he is the one who invented the steam engine. And in his efforts to try to sell that steam engine to customers, he had to be able to devise some way of letting them know how powerful this thing was. Now, The normal standard for power back then was the horse because that's what was used in industry in all the work they did. A a horse could lift 550 pounds through pulling it, one foot in one second. So that became a standard. That became a horsepower. And and we can understand that. I don't know a whole lot about automobiles today, but when I was a teenager, I was a lot more interested in it. And one of my older brothers had a... Oldsmobile 442, 400 cubic inch engine, 360 horsepower. Now that said something to me. And that said a lot to to the young people back then. Well, when you said 360 horsepower, they knew what you were talking about. They knew what kind of an engine you're looking at. We can measure that. But what do you do to measure that which is omnipotent? How do you measure that which has no limit to the power that it has? You can't. It's indescribable. Christ is indescribable because of His very nature. Christ is an eternal being. And again, everything that you and I know, anything about in this life, is limited by time. I'm 65 years old. How do I know that? Well, I know when I was born, got a birth certificate, and we have a way of measuring time. Whether you're talking about seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, or years, we have a way of measuring time. But God is outside of time. God is an eternal being. Time began when God created man in this world. And time is going to end when Christ returns in this world to destroy it, and we're called into judgment. So time's limited. But God's outside of time. So how do you measure the fact that God is a being that is eternal? The psalmist has said, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. There's no way to measure that. How can we describe that which is eternal when everything that we know anything about is limited by time? Christ then, because of His very nature, is indescribable. But secondly, Christ is also indescribable because of the purpose for which He came to this earth. 
Why did Jesus come? Why did God give His Son? Well, we know John 3.16, every one of us know that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then in the book of Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, Jesus says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. And when the angels announced the birth of Jesus to those shepherds in Luke chapter 2 and verse 11, they were told, For there is born of you this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. What is the greatest need that any individual has in life? Someone says, well, my greatest need is wealth. You know, I, I just need more money. If I had more mon- money... That would take care of all the problems about God in life. But, but wealth is not your greatest need. There are a lot of people that think that. Solomon is an individual who gained more wealth than anyone who ever lived. But he found out that that wealth was not the answer to the problems. He said in Ecclesiastes 10 and verse 19, this attitude that people have, that men prepare a meal, he said, for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. And how many people in our world today are still bound by that ignorance of thinking that money is the answer to everything. It's not. That's not the greatest need we have. Someone says, well, we need better education in our world. And I I don't doubt that. And education is important. And I would encourage anybody to get as much education as they can, but the real education we need is in what this book says. We need to be educated in the Bible more than anything else. But if you gain all of that education, if you get your doctorate degree, that's not going to meet the greatest need that you have in life. Someone says our, our greatest need in life today is a better welfare program, some way of taking care of those who are needy, those that are less fortunate. God has always been concerned about the poor. He always will be. He has always provided for His people to do what they can to take care of those who are in need. But that's not the greatest need in the world. The greatest need that you have as an individual, the greatest need that I have is the salvation of my soul. Every one of us is in need of salvation, and yet that's the one thing that we cannot give to ourselves or to anyone else. It could only be provided by God, and it could only be provided by God by a single thing, the giving of His Son to die in our stead in order that we might be redeemed unto God. Now you just think about that. How do you describe what God has accomplished in giving His Son for us? He is the indescribable gift because of the purpose for which He was given. But He's also the indescribable gift because of the grace by which He was given. Some people think that grace itself is the indescribable gift, as Paul talks about it here. But grace is not the indescribable gift. Grace was the means by which that indescribable gift was given. We can describe grace. Grace, we say, is that unmerited favor that God has shown toward us. You know, for the most part, the gifts that that we give in life, we give to people because we feel some indebtedness there. That that someone has a claim on us. You give a gift, men, to your wives. You women give a gift to your husband. Why? She's my wife. He's my husband. They have a claim on us. We feel an obligation to give to them. We do the same thing with our children. You know, I'm their father. They're my child. I, I, I feel an obligation to give to them. And two, if you'll admit it, sometimes we give the gifts to people because they gave a gift to us. Christmas time rolls around and you're writing out Christmas cards. Why are you sending a card to that person? They sent us one last year. Oh, well, okay, we need to get one sent off to them. We feel a debt because they've given something to us. There's not a one of us that has ever placed God in our debt, that God is obligated to give to us. So you think about Christ as the indescribable gift because of the grace by which He was given unto man. In the book of Romans chapter 11 and verse 35, listen to what Paul said to those brethren. Paul says, Or who has first given to Him, and it shall be repaid to Him. What individual do you know of that first gave to God And now God is obligated to give to us. You know, I I gave God something before He even thought about me. I gave Him a gift. Now He's obligated to give me. 
There's no one. No one is of that nature. In the book of Job, chapter 41, after Job has suffered so much, and, and, and God has, has shown that Job and, and his ideas is right, and his friends have been wrong in accusing Job of some great sin, and that's why he's suffering. But God has a lot of questions that he asked of Job, because Job needs to understand some things about God. And one of the questions that, that God asked him there in Job 41 and verse 11 was, Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. Again, it's the same idea. God is not under obligation to pay anybody anything. God's not under our obligation. And one of the most beautiful passages in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, Paul says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Paul shows in that that God was under no obligation to save us. He was under no obligation to give to us the gift of His Son Jesus. We were still sinners. We were still in rebellion to God. We were still fighting against God. And yet, even at that time, that's when God made this decision to send His Son to die for us. It was not a gift that was obligated, but it was a gift of love. It was a gift of grace that God gave to Him, gave His Son to us. Jesus is the indescribable gift because of the grace by which it was given. But then finally, the gift of Christ also is indescribable because of the effect that He has on us in life. What gift have you ever received from anybody that changed your life completely? If you're honest, you'll admit. I haven't received a gift from anybody that that completely changed me. But let me tell you, that indescribable gift, the gift that God gave to all of us, the gift of His Son, changes people. If you will accept that gift, it will change your life completely. Number one, it changes your relationship to God. While you're not a child of God, when you're not a Christian, you're in rebellion to God, you're in sin. But when you're obedient to Him, you accept that gift of Christ in obedience to His will, God forgives you of your sins. You're no longer counted as a sinner or as an enemy. But you're now brought into the family of God. You become God's child. And so your relationship to God has been changed by the gift that God gave to us in His Son, Jesus Christ. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus, in giving the Great Commission, He told His disciples, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. When an individual is obedient to God in believing and being baptized, he has his past sins forgiven. Acts 2.38, Peter told the people on the day of Pentecost the same thing. Peter told those people to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And so God forgives you of your sins. Your relationship to God has changed. And when God forgives your sins, He does something that all of us need to learn to do, and that is to forget it. When God forgives our sins, He forgets those sins. Hebrews 10, 17. The Hebrew writer says that their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. So God forgives and He forgets the sins that we've committed. But also, when we become children of God, when we're in obedience to the will of God, when we accept that indescribable gift, at that same time, God also makes us citizens of His kingdom. We're no longer citizens of the United States. We're no longer citizens of this world. We are now citizens of God's kingdom. For when a person accepts Christ in being baptized, he's baptized into one body. He's baptized into the kingdom of Christ. And our citizenship then, as Paul says in Philippians 3.20, is in heaven. And so it changes our citizenship. When we're obedient to Christ, we also receive the Holy Spirit from God. And that's extremely important. In Acts 5.32, the Bible tells us, and we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Now, the important thing about that is, 
And so the Holy Spirit given to us as Christians is God's guarantee of our eternal salvation. When Paul writes about this in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14, he says of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. He's the down payment. You, you buy a product, you buy a house, you buy an automobile, like we talked about that Jaguar, $80,000 down payment. That $80,000 you're giving, that's a guarantee. I'm, I'm serious about buying this car. You know, uh, you can go ahead and have that car delivered because I'm going to buy it. And, and here's $80,000 to show that. God gave us His Holy Spirit as a guarantee, as a down payment on our eternal salvation so that we could know and be assured of the fact that we will have that eternal inheritance with God in heaven. But not only that, when you become a child of God, you then receive the peace of God. All that life before that, a life of turmoil, you're in rebellion to God, you're an enemy of God, and you know you stand in danger of an eternal destruction. But when you accept that gift, that indispensable gift, it changes. And now you're at peace with God. And it's not the kind of peace that the world gives. Jesus explained in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth peace, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. An individual who accepts that gift can pillow his head at night in peace and know that everything is well between him and God. This is the peace that Paul says passes all understanding. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. That's this gift that God's given. This indispensable gift. And it's indispensable because of the very nature of Christ. It's indispensable because of the purpose for which He came, for which God gave Him to us. It is the indispensable gift that God gives because of the grace by which it was given. And it's the indispensable gift because of the fact of the change that it brings into our life. The effect that it has on us. Now the question then this morning becomes this. What am I going to do for God who's given to me this indispensable gift? What will I give back to God? There's nothing I can give to earn what He's given me. But I can give back to God to show my love and my appreciation for that indispensable gift He's given me. I will show that by becoming His child if I am not. Believing in Christ as the Son of God, John 8, 24. I will repent of my sins, Luke 13, 3. I will confess Christ before men, Matthew 10, 32. And I will be immersed in water for the remission of my sins, Acts 2, 38. And I will live my life in faithful obedience to God unto death, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. The one who's become God's child and is straight away, if you would be reminded in yourself again this morning of that indispensable gift that God has given you, that that would be enough to cause you then to do what you need to do, to repent of your sins and pray to God for the forgiveness you need, Acts chapter 8 and verse 22, and to live your life, life for God. But I would add one more thing, and that is that when we realize how God has given to us, that it would motivate us and encourage us to give to God as we've never given before. Next week, will be a special opportunity we have to give to God. The elders have set as a goal for us $100,000. There's no reason why we cannot meet that goal, especially if we give in light of God's indispensable gift to us. This morning, if you're here as one who is subject to the invitation of Christ, who needs to become His child, or His child who is heir that needs to return, we pray that you would allow the realization of what God's done for you, motivate you today, to obey Him and do His will. We encourage you to come now while together we stand and while we sing. There's a line that is